Coming up on Garden Talk. Same way that you would see a tropical forest run itself or a woodland run itself. That's how I tend to think of no-till. is not disturbing the soil and just let it do what it was naturally designed to do. So I'll take 30% of good native soil from my food forest and I'll use that to create my beds because what better way to introduce fungal and bacterial life than to take it from somewhere that's shown and proved that it can sustain something way bigger than what you're attempting to do. I see no point in being organic and going no-till and still have to feed the same way that the synthetic guys have to feed and still stay on the same cycle that they have to feed because somehow in nature, this process happens by itself. I don't have to worry about mixing bottles of nutrients and having this and running out of this. I don't have to deal with any of that no more. Now I can actually just enjoy growing. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This episode number 87. In this episode, I interview Beast Coast Grower. He was on the podcast in the past, episode number 34, and a countless number of you have requested for me to bring him back for another episode. In this episode, he talks about no-till farming, how he goes about doing it. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to VivoSun for sponsoring this episode. VivoSun recently released the Smart Grow system. The Smart Grow system helps streamline the growing process by automating stage of growth requirements, on and off schedules, spectral range, airflow and circulation, and even records useful data about your environment. It is Wi-Fi capable and connects to the VivoSun app, so you can control your grow space from your smartphone. Check out their website at vivosun.com. I will provide a link in the YouTube description section below. AC Infinity is sponsoring this episode. They have two different series LED grow lights, the Ion Board and the Ion Grid. The Ion Board fixtures are board style and use Samsung LM301B diodes while the Ion Grid series has an open center design and uses Samsung LM301H diodes. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about these grow lights and you can use discount code MrGrowIt if you're buying off their website, acinfinity.com. That discount code works for all AC Infinity items or discount code MrGrowIt15 if you're buying off Amazon. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Beast Coast Grower. How you doing today? I'm great, enjoying the day. <laughs> Same here. So you're back for a second time around. First time you talked about how you do plant training and the scrog technique in particular, which people loved. I mean, that episode passed 67,000 views on YouTube. And what? Pretty mind-blowing. Uh, there really have been a countless number of people requesting you to come back for a part two. So... Here we are. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> this time around, we're going to talk no-till farming. This is the way that you currently grow, and I'm excited to hear all about it. But first, can you introduce yourself for those that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Yes. So for everybody tuning in, I'm Beast Coast Grower 420. Um, kind of in the permaculture. That's what I'm mainly known for, doing a whole bunch of fruits and vegetables and everything. Also co-host to the Green Table podcast. Um, it, it's just good to be back. Glad you guys liked the first one. Um, that I'm, I'm really simple like everybody else. I'm just somebody who fell in love with plants. Yeah, pretty straightforward there. And so you've done a whole bunch of different styles of growing in the past, but right now you're into no-till farming. So I have a lot of beginners and intermediate folks that tune in my podcast. I do have some advanced folks as well, but I feel like a majority is beginner and intermediate. Some people might not know what no-till farming is. So can you break it down for us? What is no-till farming? Well, in my opinion, no-till farming is not disturbing the soil not disturbing the mycelium layer that's getting built, not disturbing that connection of roots that's happening inside of the soil. Like some people will go through, break the soil up after each round, re-amend it, put it back. Uh, No-till is more of a sustainable way of growing where you don't actually disturb disturb the soil other than you transplanting back into it. So to me, no-till is just letting the earth be the earth. That's the best way I can describe it. The same way that you would see 
a tropical forest run itself or a woodland run itself uh that that's how i tend to think of no-till is not disturbing the soil and just let it do what it was naturally designed to do what's the downside of disturbing the soil uh break mainly the mycelium that fungal colony that builds in the soil you you don't really want to disturb that connection because once the roots connect to that it starts pulling nutrients from distances that it normally wouldn't have been able to and the more you disturb that the less microbes you have the less fungal life that you have the more you're going to have to amend like now, now you're going to have to actually put food back into it because you're not able to you, you don't have that same access you normally would yeah, those mycelium networks can extend for miles and miles and miles. I watched the... It's one of the biggest organisms on the planet. Yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing how big those networks are. Uh, I mean, you talked about the old growth, growth forests out there, and I watched the documentary Fantastic Fungi. Not sure if you've seen that one. It talks all about it. it. Yeah, and uh, it's crazy how how long the network actually extends to, and the fact that nutrients can be be transported from so far away into the plant you know so and it's always weird how like they discuss like microbes they discuss mpk they discuss a whole bunch of other stuff and for some reason fungal is really kind of left out it's like that that thing you don't really want to talk about and i get it when it comes to like a lot of mushrooms you don't exactly know what you can eat that'll harm you and what you can eat that'll help you so i get it it's kind of a gray area but when it comes to the plants this should be one of the first topics that's spoken about yeah good point I felt kind of I felt kind of cheated after I seen Fantastic Fungi. Like, wait a minute, uh, have we been focusing on a lot of the wrong things? Today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are using you know chemicals and salts. That's one way of growing. Or there's the organic side of things, and and no till goes right with that, right? So let's start with the media or medium. Uh, what do you use for that when no till farming? It's a bunch of different ways you can start. And I know the way that I'm going to say a lot of people don't agree with. You're going to hear a bunch of people tell you that that's crazy. Don't do that. But what I choose to do is I like the ProMix BX. Uh, is People don't know there's a different type of ProMix. There's the HP. That's the high porosity one. That's the one you would mainly use if you were going to do more synthetic feeding. The BX is a heavier pro mix that you can use that's mainly used for like no-till. If you're going to build a system where that soil is going to stay put, you would rather go with the pro mix BX. Now, another thing I did in the beds that I know people won't agree with is my beds are 30% native soil. So I'll take 30% of good native soil from my food forest and I'll use that to create my beds because what better way to introduce fungal and bacterial life than to take it from somewhere that's shown and proved that it can sustain something way bigger than what you're attempting to do. So I like to take 30% native soil and also add it. But I also use uh, Happy Frog and some. I, I don't have a problem with ocean forest, but it can run a bit hot. So it's something that I tread lightly on, and if I was to use it, it would be in the very bottoms of the beds. But that that's the medium that I like to go with is 30% native soil, 70% pro mix, or maybe out of that 70%, maybe take 20% of that and use maybe uh, Fox Farm, Happy Frog, or Ocean Forest. Or maybe another one. Uh, I know they have the Malibu compost, and uh, they have uh, other ones on Build the Soil you can use as well. Yeah, I hear about more and more people using the native soil in their backyard and just grabbing that and rehabbing it, I guess you can call it. To, yeah, to, and that's where the pro mix comes in handy. Right, right. So that way it's not too compact because a lot of these plants, of course, we know that oxygen is needed down in the root zone. Some of these native soils are going to be too compact and you're just not going to get yes. optimal growth out of it. So adding in pro mix, adding in some of the, the bag soil that you use um, could certainly be beneficial on that avenue. Yeah, it's going to come with your perlite or your vermiculite. Uh, some wood chips are going to be inside of there. There's going to be things in there that help to aerate and, and let the water get through. That's another thing. If you have heavy clay soils, you, you, you stand that chance of a lot of your water not being able to even penetrate through if you don't mix it right. So that's the reason I only go 30% instead of 50-50 because you can still risk compaction if you go 50-50, depending on if you don't mix it right. So I'd rather stay on the safe side with the 30-70. Is this for your indoor garden or outdoor garden? Indoor. Okay. Both, actually. I, I, if I had to build beds outdoor, I would build them the exact same way. Okay, got it. And then what else do you amend into the medium begin? Like some folks will do some sort of amendments that have you know nutrients and that obviously break down. Are you adding anything else into the medium to begin? 
Yes. Uh, when I first make the beds, um, there's 444. Um, what is that? Down to Earth? Yeah, Down to Earth 444. Uh, Langbanite, kelp, and maybe some Epsom salt. Epsom salt is super important. It is something they always leave out when it's time to amend is Epsom salt. But uh, that calcium uptake is important and you can't do it without magnesium. So I make sure that I always add some Epsom salt to them too. And besides that, that's it. The beds run themselves after that. And, uh, oh, and also humic and fulvic. Do you know offhand the ratios that you use, like the amount you actually put in to the soil at all? or? No, I know they're supposed to be, uh, you use a cup of this or a half a cup of this. I eyeball it. I'm not going to lie. You're like a chef where you just a little bit of this, something, a little sprinkle of this. Uh, little yes. Sp- <laughs> Making sure that 444 be the uh, bulk of it, of whatever I'm going to be using, because that's the main source of MPK that they're going to be getting. The Langbanite is really, it, it's slow release, so the Langbanite will get released later, but that's a potassium source. Um so so I make sure that I add that and that and again it depends on the layer because I layer my beds like lasagna so at the bottom there will be a stronger layer of amendments than it will be at the top because you don't want to put plants right into hot soil like your peppers are burn up tomatoes are burnt you, you don't want to deal with that so you you want to go as light as possible on the top because plants don't need as much nutrients as they say they do so really light on the top and it can get heavier as it gets to the bottom okay and then you mentioned you're in beds or do you also are you also in grow pots I use I have I have some smart pots too. What size do you use and, and well what size do you recommend? At least seven. You're gonna need at least seven gallons. I know most people say five. Uh five is a pretty safe zone, but when you're gonna have to keep adding layers of hay and and other things, eventually you're just you're gonna need a little bit more. So I like to go with seven, fill it to five. And, and leave that last two because eventually it'll get filled up over time. And I don't, I don't want to deal with that and wind up having to switch these pots out. So a bare minimum of seven, but I use 20s. Yeah, I use threes, fives, sevens, and the sevens are, are easiest. You know, it's the easier to yeah, use. Sevens are the best. That. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be trying tens and trying for, for larger ones as well. So, you know, a lot of people say that the larger the grow pot or bed, the easier it is. It is. It is. And you know what? I have 20s, but I have them folded down to 10s. And after each round, you'll notice you'll have to fold the bag up a little bit more, fold the bag up a little bit more. So that's what happens over time. Oh, that's interesting. So you actually fold what, folding down the sides of it and then kind of unraveling it, grow after grow. and Yes, because you're going to have to add another layer of mulch is going to heighten it. And you don't want to have to water and then your water's running off after a while. <laughs> Everything on the bottom will eventually turn into uh, compost or worm castings, and that's what you'll be able to, that, that's what's going to keep on raising the height of it. Uh, that's a good technique. So the hay will disappear, but it'll leave a whole bunch of uh, insect frass or worm castings, whatever. Got it. That makes sense. So when does your first feeding happen, and what does it consist of? It, it, so I'll, I'm going into the beds. I'm in veg. I'm just getting the plants in there for the first time. Yeah. They're not going to get a first feeding for a month. And then what do you typically do for the that feeding? Uh, f- uh, ferments. So FPJs will, will be one of the first things that I'm going to be feeding because after they veg for that month, they'll be transitioning into the flower stages. And at that point, that's when I want to I want to boost the potassium, the phosphorus, everything else. So I'll go with FPJ feeding. FPJ, fermented plant juice. Okay, so you're doing a natural yes. farming technique there for your first feeding. Can you talk about FPJ and like how you go about doing that? It just makes sense for me to do ferments because I'm vegan. So most of the stuff that I'm throwing away is reusable anyway. So I mainly just ferment the fruits and the vegetables separately. The vegetables that I ferment, that's for veg. The fruits that I ferment, those are for bloom. So you wind up with two almost separate nutrients and you can use them at whatever stage that you want to that works best. I just normally never need them in veg because they don't take a lot of nutrients in veg, especially in big beds. So my ferment process is actually to take the fruit. Um, some people use brown sugar. Some people use white sugar. I, I like agave. I don't know why I like agave, but it's just something I always have on hand. So I'll take the agave, let it sit for a week and a half. After a week and a half, strain it, take the juices from it, dilute that probably like three milliliters to a gallon and and that's what i'll use to feed what's the shelf life on fpj truthfully i don't know they said the longer you sit sometimes the better it gets if you can store it properly 
but I try to make mine small batches at a time so I don't have them sitting around too long and wind up just having to throw them away. So I'll do them as needed, and in the meantime, any of that extra stuff will just go into the worm bin. But when I know I want to do a feeding coming up within the next week or so, that's when I'll go ahead and make the FPJ. That makes sense. And then are you just following like the recipe that, say, Chris Trump, for example, he's a well-known natural farmer on YouTube, and he has step-by-step instructions on how to do the technique. Are you just following his technique, or is there some other thing that you're doing besides what he does? I'll do a mixture of what I can from some of these people and what I can't because they're in different areas. They have access to different live plants. They have like some people use banana flower. Like I, there's no way for me to get that where I'm at. Bana- <laughs> Bananas just don't grow where I'm at. So I, I just try to fuse the two. So I'll take some of the stuff that I have access to from some of these people. And the rest of it is literally just kitchen scraps. And that, that makes life the easiest for me because I know that uh, if you're thinking like cantaloupe, You're talking about something heavy in phosphorus and potassium. It's a big, bulky fruit, you know, phosphorus and potassium. Everyone knows bananas are full of potassium. Uh, So I I try to think of it by nutrient value, like what's inside of these fruits that I'm going to be using and what part of growing would I like to add these in. So I may be a little different than some of the other ones. Got it. So your first feeding is FPJ, fermented plant juice. And then after that, I assume that you're kind of already flipped a flower at that point. So you're doing fermented Mm -hmm. fruit juice. Is that right? As your second feeding? Yes. Yes. I forgot there's a difference. There's the fermented fruit juice and the fermented plant juice. I say that the plant juice is for veg and the fruit juice is for flour. Okay. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people that do the natural farming techniques. That's what they've been doing. Or you could just make a full spectrum blend and you you basically have a one part nutrient that you can use all the way through. Huh. Okay. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. And then are you doing a third feeding after that? I try my best not to have to feed. Um, so it, it's rare that I feed. I'm straight water from beginning to end. Like if they go check the rounds that I have recently, those are ran off water for the most part. I'll feed if I decide to, but if not, they still they still hold steady. That's mainly just a microbial feeding or if I want to boost the bacteria or fungi or something. But they don't exactly need the feedings after you build the beds right. If you if you got the worms in there and if you're doing the method that I use, then you're constantly making worm castings and food. You don't have to worry about it. So how do you know when to, how do you know when to feed? It's really up to you. So if you're in week if you're in week two or fl- a flower and you're trying to get uh, more flower sites or more flowers to develop, and you want to boost that, you see you see it and you think you just want to boost that. Go ahead and and add a feeding. If you get into week five and you want to do a little bit more bulking feel free to go ahead and use the same way that you would use any other PK booster is the same way that you would use this. The only difference is you're not feeding in between time. You're only targeting those specific points where you just want to boost something. Because I I, I see no point in being organic and going no-till and still have to feed the same way that the synthetic guys have to feed and still stay on the same cycle that they have to feed because somehow in nature, this process happens by itself. No, No one's there feeding anything and yet these trees grow to hundreds of feet and they do just fine. I try to replicate that same method. Understood. Yeah, I know a lot of people doing the, the natural farming technique and, and no-till, but they're also doing, like some people use the organic blends and they'll top dress mm-hmm. at certain times. Typically, some people do, you know, 30 days into it, they'll do a top dress. Then every 30 days after that, they'll do a top dress and they'll just really just top dress and then water after that. So it seems to be like the similar frequency to what you're doing with the ferments. So would you say that's just kind of an alternate way to go about the no-till? Yes, and the ferments are readily available immediately. Like the reason that they have to feed 30 days in or, or the time after that is because that has to take time to break down. So if I'm going to want a feeding week two, I have to go two weeks back and already amend it. So two weeks later, they're finally starting to uptake it. It's finally broken down. It's finally available. When it comes to ferments, if I feed today, they took that today. So I don't have to worry about it again afterwards. Every time I'm watering afterwards, I'm pretty much just diluting what's already in there. Got it. So a big difference there. And that's definitely a pro having that uh, readily available, yeah. you know. Especially if you got a problem and you need to fix it because in soil, the hardest thing is running into a problem. Because sometimes it can take days before you can fix it and it might take weeks before it shows that fix shows up. Like you're, you're running low on, on nitrogen. You, you add some nitrogen. And, uh, two weeks later, they'll finally start greening up. But for the two weeks in between that, your plants ain't going to be looking good. I think a lot of people start off organic and they 
run into the point where they're seeing deficiencies in their plants and they'll top dress. But like you said, you got you to wait those two weeks in order for it to break down. I don't think a lot of people know about the alternative of FPJ and FFJ, the ferments. Uh, and then being readily available. So instead of resorting back to synthetic nutrients, that fact, fast acting stuff, which I think a lot of people doing, might want to consider going after a ferment since that is faster acting than just top dressing and waiting until the organics break down. Exactly. It's, it's just a cheat sheet. Like if I, if I need something right now and I know that I created this ferment out of a whole lot of greens, I know it's loaded with nitrogen. And if I feed this right now, they can uptake this nitrogen right now. Uh, but if I decide to give them some 444, it's going to be a week or two before they get ready to uptake that. And something else is most people aren't dealing with deficiencies when it comes to soy. They're dealing with toxicities. So like you'll go get your happy frog or your whatever you're going to get. You pop your plant in, but you're also going to run the Fox Farm nutrient line right along with it. What they don't tell you is to add water until that runs its course because there's there's tons of food in the happy frog and the ocean forest already. So imagine imagine you're trying to feed on top of everything that's already available there. You wind up burning your plant, but it shows up like a deficiency because you can't tell the difference. So I think most people are not dealing with deficiencies depending on what they're using. They're dealing with toxicities and overwatering. Yep. I ran into it 10 years ago when I, or 12 years ago when I first started, you know, not, not realizing that the dark, dark green leaves are actually toxic toxicity, right? Showing. Yes. Now, are you running into any toxicity issues using FPJ or FFJ? Nope, because I don't use it often. Okay. So you're controlling it. Now, if I used it, if I used it more, maybe because all the nutrients also available in the soil, but I haven't ran into that problem. I go, I'm, I'm really easy. I try to go as light as possible on the plants because there's so much available there. And when you're adding things like ferments that is feeding the microbes and bacteria, they start releasing more nutrients available for the plants. You, you, you don't have to really worry about that. I think the synthetic way of us learning just has us thinking we constantly have to keep feeding or eventually they're going to run out. But there, there's so much food available in that soil that you, you wouldn't believe it, especially in a bed. In a pot, maybe not as much, but it, you you in a four by eight bed that holds hundreds of gallons of soil, like, yeah, you, you're good. And that's where having a bigger container can make things easier because there's more availability, right? Yes. So you mentioned worms in your garden. I want to get a little bit deeper into that because a lot of people are utilizing worms in either containers or beds when they're growing organically. Now, there are t several different types of worms that you can use, right? Red wigglers, European night crawlers, African night crawlers. What do you use for worms in your beds? I choose the red red wigglers, but I also do add earthworms as well. But they serve two different purposes. Um, red wigglers are mainly going to be at the top. They're going to deal with the compost and the things that land on that top layer. They're going to break all of that down, turn that into castings for you. The earthworms, on the other hand, they're going to stay a, a bit lower. And they're they're gonna eat the peat. They're gonna eat. They they eat other things. They handle other processes. But for that top layer to get broken down as fast as possible, you're gonna want the red wigglers or the African night crawl. You're gonna want the smaller worms. The thinner worms are mainly used for composting. The bigger, thicker worms are mainly used to create tunnels and do other things inside of the soil. So I do a mixture of both, but I mainly focus on the red wigglers. Now, are you just getting the? worms from your native soil that 30 percent does that include worms or are you outsourcing it are you, you, you buying it somewhere whether it be from a, a local walmart in the bait section or whatever or ordering it online like uncle jim's worm farm is a common source that a lot of people go to where, where do you get your worms uncle jim yep so i'll, I'll get my worms from there but I, I am still adding worms all the time like if it's a rainy day and I know it's done raining. I'll go out, lift some bricks up, take some of those worms and bring them right back in as well. Just to just to keep them reproducing instead of having to keep on adding them. Why? Why? When they're free. Uh, I'll pay for them the first time when I add them. But after that, I'm never paying to add worms again. They're going to I'm going to give them every reason to stay. That's another thing. People add worms and give them nothing to do afterwards. Like you're going to add composting worms to it, but you're not giving them anything to compost. What are they going to do? Eventually, they're going to leave. You're going to start digging through your soil and you won't find worms anymore. And you're going to wonder what's going on. Well, you sent a bunch of workers to a job site and there was no work to do. So they went home. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Yeah, I, I started vermicomposting last year, so I got about a year under my belt. And um, yeah, I'm at the, at the point where I can actually just take some worms from my vermicompost bin, which is now a year-round thing, and then put it into my containers as needed. 
So it's a good way to have them on hand at all times is have a vermicompost bin. Exactly. And then every time that you have to clean it out to harvest the the castings and everything, when you add those castings, they're going to have a bunch of little worms and eggs and stuff inside of them. And they're going to re-inoculate the bed full of worms as long as you got a layer for for them to live in. As long as you got some bedding for them to live in, they'll, they'll handle the rest. Like I, I added a thousand worms per four by eight. I know a lot of people would have said use a whole bunch more. But no, I added a thousand per four by eight gave them a proper environment to live in and now there's there's more than i could ever count like you'll lift you'll lift a layer of hay and it's thousands of worms yeah because they'll reproduce right what do they make they have to make contact with each other and then they uh they reproduce that way or something like that i think so yeah but they they all they lay eggs too you'll see them all through the uh through the hay when you lift it they lay a bunch of eggs inside of there and that's why you need that and a lot of people use an avocado tech I'm not sure if you've heard about avocado that. Avocado Yeah, tech. that's uh, I have. It's a way to attract the worms into one area, right? So they'll they'll go after the avocado, and then uh, and then once they're making that contact, well, they're reproducing, so you can get faster reproduction just by putting an avocado face down onto the top of the medium. So. Yeah, that that works too. Cover crops. Let's get into that next. What do you use for cover crops, and when do you plant them? Uh, there's this, uh, uh, immediately, as soon as I make the beds, I make a layer of cover crop. That's the very first thing I do before any other plants are going in before anything. I'm going to grow a really thick layer of cover crop, really thick, like purposely. I'm going to let it overgrow itself because that's going to be the first layer of food and mulch for those beds. Cause once I hay that over, uh, that becomes the first layer of food going in is that layer of cover crop that happens right there. But, uh, hairy vetch. Um, the daikon radishes, the red clovers, the the snow peas, the the regular. I think it's like a twenty C variety that I use, and that's what I go along with. Where did you get the twenty C variety? Was it locally or probably Amazon? It was like a non. It was a non GMO uh, pack from Amazon, a cover crop, and it was like a twenty C blend. I think I showed it on my Instagram or something. The the actual pack of it. Nice, nice. Yeah, a lot of people are buying the 12 seed blend from Build a Soil. That seems to be very popular. I've used that before too. That works well too. I was just in a rush and I needed it faster. So I, <laughs> I chose to go with Amazon to, to, to get them because I needed it faster. But the, the Build a Soil one works perfect as well. You said you're planting the cover crops right away. So as the cover crop's growing up, you have to eventually cut it back, right? When do you make that call? To cut back your cover crop uh when they pass the ring of the bed so there's a distance between where my soil starts and where the actual bed is once they pass that that uh that arm rests basically on the beds that's when it's time to, to hay them over some people just cut them back i hay them over completely that's going to be the first layer of food the worms and bugs are going to love me after i smother that underneath there they're going to go crazy and all of that turns into just a massive layer of worm castings later on like you'll go back at the end of that round and it'll just be black underneath there and that's another source of nutrition right once you put yes. that mulch layer over it and it dies off and the worms are going after it and the microbes and all that stuff that's turning into usable nutrients that the plant can uptake yes and on top of it the plants themselves that that winded up getting hayed over their roots start to release nutrients once the once they notice that the plant's dead so they'll start to let go of some of the nutrients that they've been holding on to and you're watering in a worm casting tea every time you get fresh water so i can say that i'm not feeding i'm just giving them fresh water all the time but i'm not just giving them fresh water there's such a big layer of thick layer of worm castings underneath that hay that i'm watering in a worm casting tea every single time that i water are you just using the hay as a mulch layer? There are several different things that you can use. I'm not sure if you're you're just using that. Is it barley straw or, or what exactly is it? Yeah. Or alfalfa. Some people use alfalfa. There's there's a couple different ones that you can use. But yeah, but on top of that, I still do chop and drop too. So when I, when I go to leaf strip or I lollipop and clean the bottoms, all of that goes to the soil. Goes right to the soil. Does it go on top of the mulch layer or are you lifting up that mulch layer and then sliding it underneath? If it's a new layer of, of straw, then, I, then I'll purposely go underneath and put it because it takes a little while for that uh, straw to flatten. Uh, but, but if it's already been in and it's kind of flat and compacted already, then I'll just throw it right on top. It'll still serve its purpose. Eventually, it'll just disappear or it'll turn into a black spot on top of the straw. And then that'll let you know that it's now a bunch of insect frast and worm castings. Okay. Have you used any, uh, some people use wood chips as a mulch layer? Have you done that at all or no? 
I don't like wood chips because since I have to transplant back into these beds, I never want to risk this, these wood chips getting mixed back into the soil because uh, they'll start to leach nitrogen. They'll cause a whole bunch of issues being inside of your soil. They're only good for the very top layer of your soil. If I was outdoor, then maybe I would go with wood chips. I wouldn't have as much of a problem with it. But indoor, I'm not even messing around with it. I'm just going to go with straw. If I used wood chips, it's literally because I put them outside to inoculate them with some microbes and brought them back afterwards. That's the only time I'll be using them. Understood. And what type of water do you use when doing no-till? Are you using RO water, distilled, tap water, well water? What are you using for a water source? They're going to chew me up in the comments over this one. <laughs> tap. I, I, I don't get what everyone's big issue with the tap water is. go look at your lawn go look at your garden in the backyard go look at anywhere else and it's, it's tap water that's doing that like tap water is not the worst thing in the world i think mine comes out at around like 225 or something i, I think it's all calcium and, and whatever it's not i have mycelium to be able to disinfect it it's antibacterial properties inside of it i'm, I'm not exactly too worried about that like the once you learn what mycelium actually does with one layer of skin compared to ours with like seven, you start thinking about things completely different. Like, am I am I willing to waste a five to one ratio on our RO water? I'm not I'm not willing to waste five gallons of tap water to make me one gallon of usable RO water. That's that. No, I'm cool on that. So I just tap water right out the right out the hose. I think mine comes out at three to one, um, but that's still that's that's crazy as far as the. Uh... Yeah, I'm wasting three gallons just to get one of, of possibly some better water, but possibly. Tip for anybody doing that, you can always take your drain line of the RO, put it into a bucket and use it elsewhere, right? Your outdoor plants, for example. Some people are like, oh, you're wasting it with RO water. But, uh, you know, most people's drains are going right back into a local water municipal system. So it's not really being wasted. Yep. And now, now if I had bad water, like I, I hear some people's PPM out the tap and I'm like, I wouldn't use that either. Mine is 485. I, I would filter that in some way, shape, or form. Like, I don't care if I created my own charcoal filters or, or no matter, some way, I would filter that water. Yeah, mine comes out at 485 ppm, so I'm just like, I, I've got the RO system. I have to do yeah. something. It's yeah. just... Yeah, in your case, it makes sense. It's just a little bit safer because if I get through, a, if I start watering my plants, I've done this before, I water it with tap water, trying to get through it. Plants are struggling, and I need the yield, right? I need the end result off of it. And if I'm messing up my plants, all of a sudden quality goes down the drain. Well, that now my stash is going down the drain too somewhat. So exactly. So I, I safe side exactly. it, although I am revisiting the whole tap water and, and trying to use it straight from the tap. And I'm trying to get some sort of result in there. And I'm hoping that organic no-till that I'll be able to get away with it, you know? It just depends on what's coming out of it. Like if you're getting a bunch of like iron in your water, you're going to come out with a problem that 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 you won't even recognize like you'll look at it and be like am i overwatering? am i underwatering? like what's going on i've seen another grower deal with it where they were trying to keep the water from the dehumidifier so they would use the water from the dehumidifier and they were wondering why the room kept on having problems and it was because the extra iron that was coming through the coils of the dehumidifier that iron was in the water and just the smallest percentage of it was burning the plants because they don't need the amount of iron that's coming out of that. It's a small percentage to us. It's a large percentage to a plant that doesn't exactly need it. So if I had worse water, then yeah, I'd have to have some kind of system to stop it. That's interesting that that grower came across an issue where iron was leaking in through their dehumidifier. Uh, I've actually come across studies where I think it was by like Quest dehumidifier or humidification systems, that company, they have a study on theirs. They, they did testing and everything seemed to be clear on multiple dehumidifiers, but uh, but it's kind of like a, it's a biased source, I guess you can say, because they're selling that equipment, right? Quest also has a completely different system than the person who was using this dehumidifier was using. That wasn't a Quest. Well, well they tested other brands as well. I forget exactly what the... Oh, and, and they found out that it was they cool? They found out it was cool, yeah. And then copper was like, there was like trace amounts of copper, but that was it, like parts per billion or something like that. So like very small amounts. But I'll have to revisit that study. It's interesting that that grower came across that. And the moment that they stopped using the water that they were reclaiming from the dehumidifier, the problem went away in the garden like this. So it could have just been their dehumidifier. But there's, there's just instances where you're going to need a filter. Like, I'm not just one of those people that's just all or nothing. We got to be for the environment. We, I get that. 
and, and I love that. But uh, if my tap water's coming out at 480, I'm doing something about that. Like I, <laughs> I can't just feed that to my plants. Like you, you mix three bottles of nutrients and it comes out to 480. Like <laughs> <laughs> I can't have that coming fresh out the tap into my plants. Right. Yeah. I mean, the elements, some cations. You know, if there's an excess of some elements. They could lock out other elements, inhibit the uptake of other elements. So if you have a whole bunch exactly. of cations of calcium, for example, it could be inhibiting the uptake of magnesium or some of the other cations. So that balance is, is certainly important. Yes. Now, are you pHing your water? No. I think I think my pH of the water is like 6.3 or something. So it comes out in the range that is acceptable for, for the plants that you're growing. And then the langbanite and stuff like that buffer it once it gets inside of the soil, so it's, it's fine by the time it touches. If the water out of your tap came in at like 8.0 pH, would you pH adjust I'm it? I'm lowering it. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Again, I, I just lucked up and winded up with a situation where everything just kind of worked the way it was. But I know everybody's situation isn't going to be like that. So if your tap water is coming out way too acidic or way too alkaline... Do something about that. I get it. You want to be as natural as possible. Find a natural way to lower it. Like, there's natural ways to lower your pH as well, but the pH up and down ain't, ain't the worst thing in the world. Uh, get your pH in range to make sure that your plants are happy. That's the that's the end goal is to have happy plants. So don't be so encased in, I don't want to use anything that you, you're willing to sacrifice the round. Don't do that. You know, some people are worried about using those few drops of phosphoric acid uh, lower their pH, and they think it's just wiping out their micro population, which isn't true. You know, it's just some misinformation no. that's been passed along generation to generation, and uh, it's been debunked over and over and over again. So, yeah, if those folks that are in living soils, you know, growing organically, you can use a little bit of pH up and pH down. And um, it's not going to drastically harm your population to where your plants are going to be all screwed up and you're not going to get a harvest. No, it's not going to destroy all of your microbes. It's not going to destroy your fungal colonies and all the other funny stuff that they decided to tell you guys. None, none of that is going to happen over a few drops of some pH up or down. It is not the end of the world. And you guys being like 30 gallons, like, and you're worried about a few drops. Like, no, nah, that isn't, isn't going to make a difference. Now, do you incorporate any sugars into your garden at all? When I feed the ferments. Okay. So just that, you're not doing any, like some people do molasses. No, it's in the ferment. So there, there's no point in adding it separately. If I, if I want to do a sugar feed and I'll just add some of that. Makes sense. So it's kind of one less step. Yep. And the only time I'm feeding that anyway is late in flower. Like there's no other time where the plant's going to really need some sugars. Are you adding in any microbial inoculants at all? IMOs. Okay. Yeah. So I'll go and get the microbes and stuff myself, but do I use any specific product? No. Okay, so no specific product of microbial inoculants, but you're doing IMO, the IMO process. Can you actually break that down for those that don't know what IMO is? Uh, indigenous microorganisms. So outside in nature, there's plenty of fungal and bacterial life if you know how to go and find it. Some people, uh, they, they'll sit like rice out or something and they'll collect it that way. Some people will take the leaf mulch, lift it up, find the fungal colonies, take that. Uh, I cheat and either use a paper bag or cardboard on a rainy day. I'll let it sit out there and then I'll go back later on, lift the cardboard and it'll just be covered in fungi. And I'll shred that into pieces, bring it back up, let the worms go through it and everything and it'll inoculate the beds themselves. That's pretty cool. I never heard about that cardboard technique. Yeah, cheat sheet. So if you got some dirt, just go out there, lay it, lay it down, let it rain on top of it or water it yourself. When you come back in a few days later, as that box is kind of sort of starting to break down, you'll lift it up and it'll just be covered with fungi on one side of it. I'll have to try that out. Yeah, I live in the desert, so I'm like, I'm oh, mostly yeah. dirt out here. You'll be, you'll be surprised what you can <laughs> find. <Yeah. laughs> so maybe that'll work. Maybe that'll, that'll uh, bring up some of those microbes uh, and then I'll, maybe I'll be able to use them in my garden in the future. Because now they're protected from the sun. Now they have uh, something they can latch on to. And you'll be surprised how much of it it is. I was shocked. Like when I first seen the method done, I, I went and tried it myself. And then afterwards, I looked and I'm like, yo, <laughs> like, I think everyone should know about this. I even took the dirt layer that was underneath it because that was fully covered in mycelium afterwards. So I even took that with me as, as well. That's awesome. That's really cool that that works. How about aerated compost teas or nutrient teas, plant teas, manure teas, anything like that do you do? Uh, I'll do a tea probably once every couple of rounds. So I uh, main, 
it's mainly just for root health is what I'm doing it for. It's not for readily available nutrients or anything. It's mainly just for like root health. So I'll do like stinging nettle, uh, maybe a little bit of neem. Um, I like, and, and maybe just some worm castings or some IMO or something. That's the, that's the most I'm going to do. I try to keep it as simple as possible. Like I didn't want to take no till and turn it into synthetic growing all over again. By having to do five six different things throughout the stage of flower like my entire last two rounds was just water i didn't even feed them didn't so for to. the teas that you do just to dig a little bit deeper into that how do you brew the tea uh i i have like uh you get the mesh um put everything inside of there and brew it just like everybody else hang it off the side of your res and and let it brew for 24 hours Sorry, what, what I missed what it actually consists of. It consists of worm castings, and then you said neem in there as well? Neem, yep. I'll use neem for root health. Uh, and it's also a good nitrogen source. Um, and stinging nettle, because one thing you're going to worry about in no-till is going to be fungus gnats. And a nice, easy way to get rid of fungus gnats is to brew stinging nettle teas because they don't like it. They can't stand it. So when you water in stinging nettle teas into your soil, you're kind of decreasing your chance of having that fungus gnat outbreak because it, it'll it'll destroy them for you so that, that's the most i'll do if if i do it now i'm not telling no one to not do it uh please use all the aerated teas that you want to the more the better like i'm not going to tell you guys not to do that but I, I just don't do it often yeah this is just your style of growing right there's so many different ways to do it and that's a good question for the audience actually tuning in right now if you're doing no-till or if you're growing organically in general, what way do you do it? Let us know down in the comment section below some of your techniques. Do you do the same techniques as Beast Gross Grower here or are you doing your own thing, a different way to go about it? Let us know. I love going through the comment section and reading and just seeing the different methods that are out there because it's so many. And they poke holes in a lot of your theory sometimes. Like sometimes you'll have a way of doing something and somebody will be like, hey, instead of that, why don't you just try this? And you're like, genius yeah <laughs> genius how did i not how did i not think of that like how did i not see myself running into this problem or that problem like you know what you're absolutely right thank you so i, I still watch a whole bunch of no-till growers i don't think i know it all i, I love all of the no-till growers out there queen of the sun grown full of knowledge people like that i nerd out on all day ipm i want to get into that before we wrap things up here i know this wasn't on our original list of questions but uh, if you're comfortable talking about it, you know, one of the common concerns of people going to organics or going to no-till is that they think they're going to have bugs, more prone to pests. Do you do anything in particular in order to prevent pests? The native soil. So you'll, you'll find an area that is loaded with plants. And you will see mite damage on some of those plants. You'll see mildew on some of those plants. You'll see bugs eating on some of those plants. And then you'll see a section that's just pristine. That lets you know that there are predators there in large numbers keeping the pest down. I want the soil from that section. That's going to bring in all of the predator mites and everything else that I need. But if need be, I would also release predator mites. And that's the, the most I would do. I try to stay away from spraying anything in no-till situations. And I just haven't had no bug problems. Mainly because I brought the good bugs to fight the bad bugs. Uh, some people want to fight it with, with a spray bottle. I, I don't have time to be doing that. <laughs> That's a lot of spraying, especially when you got dense canopies and you tight spaces. You don't want to be going in there spraying all the time. So I just make sure that I find areas when I bring the native soil that like I specifically look for areas heavy in bug damage. And then I look for an area that's not heavy in bug damage that's nearby. And I'll know that this area has more predators than that area, apparently, because you can see the damage done to one and not done to the other. So I want the area that has nothing done to it. That's right next to it. That's the, that's the best way I can think of it. Yeah, so I know I'm bringing a whole bunch of predators in. I've seen them. I've looked at them under microscopes. I've, <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's predators all over the place in my garden, and I'm perfectly okay with that. And I would release some too if I didn't have that. That would be my IPM right there is to release predators or use like a jadam spray. Uh, maybe use a jadam wetting agent with maybe like a compost tea or something. Uh, there's safer soaps that you can use and spin a sad and the rest of that. I don't like doing all of that. So, so far, so good. If I run into that problem, I may wind up using a different product, but so far, so good. That makes sense. 
So we're getting up towards the end of the episode here. Uh, a couple more things I want to ask you, actually. One of them, do you have any advice on no-till farming that we didn't talk about here in this episode or just general advice for beginners? Do your best to maybe use beds if you can. Um, like, like the pots do work. Don't get me wrong. The pots work amazing. But if you're going to be doing no-till and the soil is not going to be going anywhere anyway, then just go ahead and use the beds. There's no point in still cleaning up your floors in between all of these pots and everything when you could just have, if you got a 4x4 tent, they have 4x4 beds. You got a 5x5 tent, they got 5x5 beds. Um, There's really no point in in doing pots if you don't have to. Now, if you may have to move these plants at some point in time, you got inspectors coming through or people coming by, you might have to move these one day, go ahead and use your pots. But if not, use beds. Um, You kind of save yourself from overwatering. It's a little harder to overwater at that. Because you're just kind of going by judgment of how much water these beds need. And they hold a lot too. So it's kind of hard to overwater. Um, and these plants don't need as much nutrients as you're thinking. That's another word of advice that I'll give you guys. Like if you're if you're going to do anything close to the method that I said where you're amending when you make the soil. Or you're starting with a super soil. Use fresh water and maybe Epsom salt for as long as possible. Let, let, let the nutrients run its course because you're going to start feeding in there. You're going to get dark green leaves. You're going to deal with nitrogen burn. You're going to deal with all sorts of problems uh, if, you, if you go ahead and start feeding like you're in a synthetic system. That nutrient needs to run its course. Less is more. A hundred percent less is more. Like you guys heard, I, I dilute the ferments three milliliters per gallon. That's not a lot at all. <laughs> That's not a lot at all. And it, but yet it's more than enough. Because we're talking about a pure concentrate. So at three milliliters a gallon, it's still plenty. I have yet to venture down the FPJs and FFJs, but it's on my list of things to do. I think probably next grow is when I'm going to try it out for the first time. And I'm excited because it's something I haven't done before. You know, I've been gardening for 12 years now and I haven't done that. And there's actually still other ways of growing that I haven't done. And just doing these different ways, it's just been so fun. And that's why I encourage people folks listening in just have fun with it you know don't try not to get overwhelmed with all the different ways to go about it just just try one way and then see what happens and make adjustments from there because check back last episode i was in one gallon pots of cocoa on tables with watering systems and said soil grows too slow and everything but outdoor i'm a 100 percent no-till grower so i'm like let i have an extra room let me just try no-till indoor and just see how it is and i and i'm gonna I'm going to go with the stun method, sheer, total, utter neglect. I'm going to build these beds the way that I'm thinking I'm going to build them, and I'm going to give the plants straight water the entire round just to see how much nutrients is actually here. Went the entire round, and it was beautiful. Converted all the other rooms to no-till after. (laughs) And that's just how it happened because it was more fun. It freed me up on more time. I don't have to worry about no watering systems getting clogged. I don't have to worry about mixing bottles of nutrients and having this and running out of this. I don't have to deal with any of that no more. Now I can actually just enjoy growing. So, yeah, definitely a big change from last year. We actually recorded that first episode October of last year. So one year ago (sighs) is when we actually filmed that episode. So I'll definitely have that episode linked down in the YouTube description section below. If you're on one of the podcast platforms, just search for it. You'll find it. Let's uh, let's wrap things up here. How can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, You can find me Beast Coast Grower 420 on everything. Uh, And you can also find me Sundays at the Green Table podcast Um, coming up in the future. um, A lot of organic talk. A lot of regenerative agriculture talk, uh, a lot of ways to show you guys how to be more sustainable and a game where it's forcing you to have to be more sustainable. Like eventually there's going to be no way around it. That's how I got here because it's almost (laughs) it's almost no way around it, but to become as efficient as possible. And I think this method is the most efficient method that there is. No till in some way, shape or form or organic gardening in some way, shape or form to me is going to be more viable than any other system that you're going to be using. So a lot of that coming up and more episodes with the green table sweet i'll definitely have a link to your channel down in the youtube description section below if you enjoyed this episode click that thumbs up button also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already every single weekend i'm releasing one of these new garden talk podcast episodes and i would love for you to tune in to future episodes beast coast once again man thanks so much for coming on and spilling your knowledge about no-till you know, last episode we had was the Scrog technique, and you killed it, man. So many people love that. A lot of great information. I think this episode is a lot of great information as well. Something completely different. And um, thanks once again. One more thing. Yeah, go ahead. I'm still using that exact same Scrog method. 
So the same scrog technique that I was talking about using with the one gallon pots of cocoa in the water, I still use the exact same scrog method now. I transferred that right over. The only thing that changed was the medium. That's awesome. All right, well, thanks again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, same to you. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode. Peace.